Alrighty guys, welcome to our ongoing series of lessons where we're going to talk about how evolution is an ongoing process. Um, and uh, if you're drinking something and you're able, pour one out for our lost homies, the dinosaurs. Never forget guys, never forget. Alright, so all species have evolved and continue to evolve so there is evidence that evolution is an ongoing process that is occurring even now and we're going to look at some of that um so with the rise of the ability to study genomes we've been able to see that um a lot of genome changes have happened over time in various species so we can compare the genomes of closely related species in order to um, determine one, whether they're different species or just populations of the same species, and um, look at their divergence and evolutionary relationships, etc. cetera. Uh, this can show also whether um, they're, what, where their most recent common ancestor is, or if there's even been interbreeding events that have taken place in between um, modern uh, the last common ancestor in modern times for example genomic analyses have allowed us to see that there was interbreeding between neanderthals and humans uh after our species diverged uh you know i don't remember exactly maybe like several hundred million years ago um and so that indicates that we were still similar enough genetically to be able to interbreed um, one of the examples, I have something up here, it's showing the uh, kind of uh, abbreviated phylogeny of a number of flowering plants. And every place where you see one of these stars is a place where gene duplication events took place, um, or even genome duplications. Um, and so you'll see in a lot of um, the history of different species, there have been these genome uh, duplication events. So for example, before pears and apples diverged from each other, you had a genome duplication in their last common ancestors with organisms like uh, peach and strawberry and etc. Um, so studying whole genomes is just like looking at um, genetics to uh, look for evidence of uh, evolutionary changes in time. Uh, you can also see some evidence in the, in the fossil record in that there will be some gradual differences between fossils of species as, you know, populations continue to evolve and one species um, gives rise to others. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at fossils of ancestors of cetaceans. And cetaceans are dolphins, whales, uh, those mammals that live in the sea. So in their ancestors, for example, this one was 47 million years ago. Uh, the nostrils were located at the front of the snout, just kind of like a dog's nostrils, a cat's nostrils, um, and uh, other animals like that. And as the animals started transitioning to become less land-based or terrestrial and more aquatic, the nostrils in some intermediate fossils start moving back until we get to modern day cetaceans, which have their nostrils on the top of their head. Uh, you know this as a blowhole in a whale, for example. Well, that process of the nostrils gradually moving farther back is something that we can track in the fossil record. Um, another uh, a case of modern day evolution is the evolution of resistance. This happens in all sorts of organisms. So for example, if you have pesticides killing bugs, um, animals can develop resistance to those. Um, if you have herbicides killing um, plants or weeds, those can grow resistance. If you have uh, antibiotics uh, being used to kill off bacteria, bacterial species can develop resistance as well. So here's what happens. There's a population of, like in this example, bugs. One of them, there's genetic variation. They are not all genetically identical. And one of them has a trait that if they would be exposed to some sort of pesticide, would let them survive. So somebody sprays pesticides on this group of bugs. The one that has a trait that gives them an advantage when pesticide is around survives. And a lot of the other guys die. Then there's less competition. So each of these can pass on their genes more effectively, including this guy. So later generations will start to have more individuals with that 
gene that confers resistance. If you apply pesticides again, again, you're just killing off the ones who are vulnerable, but the ones who are resistant stick around. And eventually after many applications of pesticides, you'll see that most of the population ends up being resistant. Now, why wasn't all of the population resistant before you applied pesticide? Well, that mutation that uh, pe confers pesticide resistance may have been um, neutral or it may even have been harmful slightly. It may have uh, made some process a little more a uh, little less efficient so that way that organism wouldn't be as reproductively successful it's only when the environment changed and a pesticide was applied that those organisms suddenly became more fit so remember fitness is relative if the environment changes the traits that are actually making you more fit and are more adaptive are going to change as well so this has happened increasingly with bacteria and um this happens in a similar manner. So uh, you have an initial possible, um, you have initial population of bacteria. Some of them happen to be, uh, they happen to have some traits that would make them resistant to an antibiotic. This is not something they develop in response to the antibiotic. Notice that your initial population is starting before the antibiotic is even there. So remember, evolution doesn't happen, the mutations don't happen in response to the environmental change. It's just the variation in the population means that some of them might have genes that make them able to deal with this environmental change more easily. So we have these um, bacteria, population with multiple traits, but the trait we're highlighting is one that when we add antibiotics would actually give them an advantage. So most of the organisms, most, most of the bacteria that are susceptible to the antibiotics will die. The ones that are not, that are resistant or that have a genetic advantage that makes them less likely to be killed by the antibiotics survive, and then they have less competition, so now they're able to reproduce quickly. Uh, that's very similar to the pesticides we saw. Unfortunately for us, um, Bacteria have the capability to perform what's called horizontal gene transfer. If you remember when we talked about plasmids and pili, um, a resistant bacterium can trade little snippets of genes to uh, species that are not even necessarily closely related. So this doesn't even happen within the same species. Once a gene um, ends up proving advantageous uh, under like conditions of being treated with antibiotics, it will survive and it will get passed on both within that same species of bacterium and potentially in species of other bacteria. This is a really big problem because more and more bacteria are becoming what we call superbugs, meaning they're resistant to all of the antibiotics we have. Um, that's why you will rarely see anyone being, di uh, being given penicillin as a treatment because a lot of bacteria have become resistant to it since it's our oldest antibiotic. Um, and so we have to find new antibiotics or new methods of treating these bacteria. Another uh, ongoing case of evolution is diseases. So diseases not only continue to evolve new diseases like COVID-19, which we are experiencing, um, but they can also change over time. So uh, some of the pathogens that have emerged in uh, the most uh, recent years in the past century, uh, Zika the, was thought to have first emerged in 1947. Uh, keep in mind, it well before it became, you know, kind of a, an epidemic that people had to worry about throughout the world. Um, it was slowly building up in populations. Something similar happened with HIV, which is thought to have originated in around the 1920s, building up slowly in populations. It just wasn't identified as a separate novel disease until the 1980s. Um, another thing about HIV, HIV mutates very quickly. You may think to yourself, and a lot of people are thinking when they're thinking about the speed of vaccine development, well, we've known about HIV for decades and there's no vaccine available for it. Well, it's not that scientists haven't been working on it. It's not that um, nobody, you know, is able to do it very quickly. It's that mu HIV mutates so rapidly that once you would develop a vaccine against a strain, that strain might no longer be uh, infecting new members of the population. So it, it's something to keep in mind that the properties of the virus, properties of the disease affect how we can treat it and mutation rates and the evolution of these uh, viruses and other infectious particles uh, is very important.
So let's look at speciation. Speciation is basically you have two populations of a species start to become so genetically distinct from each other that in general they can no longer interbreed. We're going to talk about reproductive isolation quite a bit and we're going to look at that soon. And remember speciation is usually seen as a split on a phylogenetic tree. So here you see two different speciation events. One that uh, from a common ancestor that gave rise to Drosophila obscura, a species of fruit fly, and the other one gave rise to the common ancestor of Drosophila dentissima and Drosophila melanogaster, the uh, lab fruit fly. Um, so there are multiple ways to define species. Um, the oldest way is by morphology, but based on their physical appearance. Um, this is the only way we really have unless you're lucky enough to get a DNA sample. This is the major way we have to classify fossils into different species. However, there are issues with this. And the biggest issues are the fact that um, you can have what's called sexual dimorphism. Um, and in sexual dimorphism, you're gonna have very distinct uh, appearances of males and females of the same species. One of the most dramatic examples of that is the peacock and the peahen in India. Uh, the peacock is the male, and it is super bright and super pretty, and the peahen's just kind of like very drab because the females are the ones who are doing the sexual selection, and they prefer the males with the showiest plumage, even though that plumage is not an advantage unless it comes to like mate selection. Because let me tell you, if a tiger is ch chasing a peacock, the one with the longer tail is probably going to get eaten. And this is really common in birds. You'll also see that in a, several species of primates, that males tend to be larger and um, have other differences in their appearance from females. And then there's also the fact that, um, especially for, you know, invertebrates, uh, some of them may have juvenile forms or young forms that are very different from their adult forms. Just think about a caterpillar and a butterfly. If you did not know that caterpillars turn into butterflies, would you classify them as the same species? Maybe not. You might think one's a worm, the other one's, you know, a flying bug. They can't be the same species. Um, but there's also uh, what we tend to use most often when we're defining species, the biological species concept. And this means that uh, populations are parts of the same species if they can successfully reproduce with each other. And they have to be uh, reproductively isolated from other species as well. This is most useful for organisms that reproduce sexually and for extant or in existence species as well. Um, there are many other ways to define species, but we're not going to go into them here. So when we're looking at the, the pace of the evolution that's happening and the development of new species, there are two different paces that this can happen. Uh, it depends on how the environment's changing. So remember, natural selection, evolution, all of this adaptation happens in response to changing environments. So if you have an environment that changes um, really rapidly and then stays the same for a long time, then the evolution is likely to happen by a punctuated equilibrium, which is you're going to have an original species and then um, species, different species as they diverge will gather differences, but they'll be very sudden followed by long periods of time when they don't really change much. But once again, that's when you have an environments that are, that are like that, that change rapidly. Gradualism would happen in um, environments that are changing slowly, little by little over time. And you'll see the changes in the species reflect that. So if you start to have, you know, predation or some sort of, sort of other selective pressure, then, um, in, or like an environmental change, like climate, then if that happens slowly and in small increments, then you'll see these gradual changes in the species. Um, it used to be people thought that you had to be one or the other, either gradualism or punctuated equilibrium, but now we know that either one of those can happen in the history of a species. Divergent evolution is what is giving rise to all these different species. So speciation happens because of divergent uh, evolution. So uh, organisms in new habitats or in changing habitats um, acquire different adaptations to fit in those habitats and be reproductively successful. And as these species build up genetic differences, that's when speciation can occur. So that's what happened, for example, in the big, big cat species, um, big cat family. 
or Felidae. Um, and so there was a common ancestor of them all, moved into different environments, and in those different environments, different adaptations became useful. Um, you know, you'll see a variety of sizes in the big cat family. Um, you'll see differences in fur coloration and some differences in morphology, like cheetahs, for example. Their bodies are designed for sprinting. Lions, their bodies are designed for like quick spurts of hunting, but not like super fast. They'll like ambush their prey and they'll hunt as a group. So um, all of that came about because of divergent evolution. Um, divergent evolution, a specific case of it, is adaptive radiation. This happens when there's a very rapid diversification of species. Um, so the speciation rates can be really ha uh, rapid when you have new habitats or new niches become available. Uh, so this can happen when organisms move into a new environment or new habitat, or it can happen after a mass extinction event. So what you're seeing here is the adaptive radiation of marsupials after they moved to Australia. So marsupials actually um, evolved in, um, they actually evolved in South America. Then uh, back then South America, Antarctica and Australia were connected by land bridges and like physically kind of interconnected. So the ancestor of Australia's marsupials um, moved from South America to Antarctica over to Australia. And then there were all these empty niches for mammals. So the marsupials diversified into all these different forms. So we've talked about reproductive isolation. Let's talk about it in more detail now. Um, it's basically two groups of organisms can no longer exchange genes anymore. There's no gene flow between them. Um, this is especially important in species that reproduce sexually. Um, they evolve distinct different lineages from each other. And then as these differences accumulate and build up, it reduces the chance that if these organisms are in contact with each other, they'll be able to reproduce. So there are multiple types of isolation, and we're going to look at each of them. Um, here is a, a very subtle and yet uh, interesting um, example of uh, reproductive isolation. There is a whole lab that uh, we generally do from HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, where we look at the speciation of anoles, a type of lizard, on Caribbean islands. And what you find is that um, they reproduce or they select mates using these little flaps of tissue that come down from their chin. Uh, and they're different colors. And so since they're different colors, they, they register amongst uh, members of the opposite sex as different species. So for example, this guy right here, he's displaying a yellow skin fold and these guys are displaying red. They will not recognize each other as potential mating partners. They won't reproduce and then they become reproductively isolated and are different species. Um, and this, um, basically, if you have increasing genetic divergence, the more di di distinct you are genetically, the more isolated you'll be. This isolation can take millions of years to develop. Um, for example, this isolation isn't necessarily complete between some species. We'll talk about that when we talk about hybrids later, um, or it may develop very quickly after a few generations. So, um... As far as speciation goes, there are two major types that we're going to focus on. One is allopatric speciation. You can talk about your patria or your country. Uh, allo means different. Um, and allopatric speciation is basically you end up in different lands, kind of. Um, so you are um, separated by some sort of physical or geographic barrier. It could be when continents are drifting apart. Um, it could be when sea levels rise or fall, glaciers advance or retreat, or when the climate changes. So for example, what we're looking at is an image of kind of uh, historic North America. And in the past, there was this uh, population of fish in various like rivers and lakes and such in um, the central highlands. Then a glacial period happened and the glacial period, during the glacial period, those populations got separated from each other into the Eastern Highlands, the Ozarks and the Wachitas. And what happened is you ended up having the fish start to 
really, really diverge. So that these all came from a common ancestor and they ended up in those different uh, regions separated by mountains, separated uh, during glaciation. And they all evolved these distinct differences that um, makes them, them very different from each other. Um, another thing that can happen is members of a population can uh, basically do what we observed in the founder effect. They leave and go to a new place. So if you look, here's South America, and here are the very famous, for evolution purposes, Galapagos Islands. You'll see a lot of Finch examples with evolution because that's a lot of the work that Darwin did and, and used as his evidence for evolution. Um, so Finches uh, in South America... Um, got maybe blown off course, somehow ended up on the Galapagos Islands, and then they spread from one island to another. Now, these islands are relatively far apart from each other. They're not like buddy-buddy neighbors, um, and they have different environmental conditions from each other and from the mainland. So you'll see from a common ancestor from the South American mainland, you have all of these different finches that are all different species diverged. And some of them are found on some uh, islands, others are found on other islands. Um, and so this is uh, basically allopatric speciation because they're separated by water. Then you have sympatric speciation. This is when you have speciation, but you don't have the physical barrier. Um, this can occur in a couple of ways. You could have disruptive selection, kind of, you know, um, select for traits on opposite ends of the phenotype spectrum, or you could have organisms prefer um, different uh, have microhabitats like the example here. Apple maggot flies have diverged into multiple species. One group lays eggs only on hawthorn trees and the other one lays eggs only on apple trees. Um, and this results in kind of this, the separation by habitat but it's only like small bits. You can have an, a hawthorn tree next to an apple tree. You can have different populations of flies on each and they won't interbreed, not because they're not in the same place, but because they will only reproduce on those specific fruit trees. Um, and then sympatric speciation can also occur commonly by polyploidy. Uh, remember polyploidy, more than two sets of, uh, of full chromosomes. So it'd be 3N, 4N, etc. Very common in plants um, because they can self-fertilize and for some reason polyploidy is not as harmful in plants or not harmful in plants at all compared to polyploidy in animals where it can be harmful. So there are a couple of examples of polyploidy causing speciation in animals. The biggest one is gray tree frogs in the northeastern United States. Um, there's a gray tree frog and then there's Cope's gray tree frog and you physically, visibly cannot tell the difference between them. If you see them, you will think they're the same species because there's also some phenotype variation within each species. Some are brown, some are green, some are gray. Uh, the only way you can tell the difference is if you either tried to mate them or if you did a genetic study. But basically, Cope's gray tree frog happens after a genome duplication where the diploid gray tree frog became the tetraploid copes gray tree frog. And they're not able to reproduce with each other. We'll talk about the isolating mechanisms of that in a moment. So what is the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation? Sympatria, sympatria literally means the same country. Allopatric means like different country. So in allopatric, they're physically separated. Sympatric, they're not physically separated. They're reproductively isolated. In allopatric, they're geographically isolated. Uh, so let's talk about hybrids now. Hybrids are the product of uh, some mating between organisms of two different species. Um, this is very common in a lot of the uh, like kind of uh, commercial like fruits and vegetables and stuff that we eat. So for example, if you like those cutie oranges, those are technically called clementines, like this guy right here. Well, clementines are not their own species. They are a hybrid between a willow leaf mandarin orange and a sweet orange. And you may think, uh, it all looks like oranges and they all probably taste really similar, but they'll, they'll have different properties. Like, you know, clementines tend to be easier to peel. 
um, the taste will be different, and you probably can't like just like propagate clementine trees from each other. I don't know, plants are weird sometimes. Um, but my favorite example is in the big cat species. So lions and tigers are actually similar enough that they can produce hybrids. They're more uh, geographically isolated from each other because lions are in Africa and tigers are in Asia. But uh, there are cases when uh, they've been close to each other in zoos or captivity and they are technically capable of reproducing. So if a lion dad mates with a tiger mom, that produces a liger. Um, and ligers are famous because they are very, very large. They're much larger than um, their, their parent, either of their parents. Uh, if a tiger mom mates with a lion, uh, I mean, if a tiger dad mates with a lion mom, then it's called the tigon. And it looks kind of like, it really does look like a cross between a tiger and a lion because it has a, ma a mane. It's just smaller than uh, that of a lion. And it's got some stripes but not as dramatic as those of a tiger. So those are hybrids. Uh, you can have hybridization happen between closely related species. So for example, if you have any experience with mules or donkeys, those are different species and mules are actually not even an, a species of their own. Mules are produced when a female horse and a male donkey have a baby. Now they have different numbers of chromosomes. So a horse has 64 chromosomes, a donkey has 62. That means that a, you know, a mule that they produce will have 63 chromosomes in the end. And it's not an even number of chromosomes. So that donkey, I mean, that mule is not going to be able to produce functional gametes. So hybrids are often less fit. Uh, whether that's just they're less reproductively fit or they could even be less physically fit, less likely to survive. Um, and so then natural selection favors the parents who did not cross species boundaries to reproduce in these cases. So there are a number of ways that species are separated from each other um, and we can divide them into two major groups. Prezygotic means that they're going to prevent any even necessarily attempts at reproduction from occurring. Um, and uh, you can see this really strongly in like sympatric speciation examples. Postzygotic is um, they're they're capable of producing offspring or mating, but those offspring are not going to be fertile or not going to be able to reproduce, and so that's not gonna they're not gonna have very much reproductive fitness. They're not going to be evolutionarily fit. So let's take a look at some prezygotic isolating mechanisms. Uh, there's mechanical isolation where the reproductive organs physically don't fit. So what you're looking at here is um, two snail species and their, their shells actually curl in opposite directions. And since they curl in op opposite directions, that results in some differences in their, their body um, anatomy and their genital openings physically cannot align, so they are incapable physically of reproducing with each other. Um, in plants, since plants use an intermediate to reproduce, like pollinators, um, that can also be a, a form of mechanical isolation if they're pollinated by different species. So an example is black sage and uh, white sage. So black sage flowers are much smaller um, and so they really can't support large um, bees or insects trying to get pollen from them. So they are pollinated almost exclusively by smaller, uh, smaller honeybees and very small insects. White sage flowers are larger, so um, they can be pollinated by larger bees or um, like uh, moths or things like that. Um, they can't be pollinated effectively by the smaller bees because the smaller bees won't um, and, and like physically touch their, their anthers and grab pollen from them to put onto another flower. So these two species don't reproduce um, between themselves. They are uh, isolated by just this mechanical fact that their flowers are different sizes, so they get different pollinators, and the pollinators don't cross between. So if you have a pollinator that pollinates the black sage, it's not going to go and then try and uh, get pollen from a white sage because the, the fit's just going to be wrong. Uh, you can also have temporal isolation. So these are three closely related species of frogs. Uh, that's what rana means, like rana-like 
you know, Rana in Spanish. And here we see on this graph, January, February, March, April, May, we're seeing a timeline of the entire calendar year, and we're seeing when they lay their eggs. Well, this top species, Berlandiri, is going to lay its eggs in fall. Uh, Blairy is going to lay its eggs in spring. And then um, Sphenocephala is going to lay its eggs in like late winter, early spring. So since their eggs are being laid at different times, they can't reproduce with each other. Um, keep in mind that uh, frogs can have some external fertilization um, so that a female will lay her eggs and the male will come along and deposit the sperm over them. Well, those eggs aren't gonna last for long. They either, if they're not fertilized, they'll start breaking down or they'll get eaten by predators or decompose. And so if a male comes along two months later and tries to deposit sperm, well, it's not gonna interact with those eggs, they're gone. Um, so if reproduction happens at different times of year or even different times of day, there are some flowers that will only bloom at night um, others that will only bloom during the day and uh, when their pollen is exposed if they're not exposed at the same time they can't reproduce with each other there's also behavioral isolation there are some species that are very very picky about courtship behavior so what you're looking at in this gif is actually grebes which are a type of bird and they have a very complicated courtship dance as you can see right here this is only part of it um, and if the courtship dance is wrong, so if another bird came along and tried to um, attract a mate here, the grebes wouldn't even look at it like, oh my God, you can't even dance. I'm not going to mate with you. Um, then uh, another example, you have coloration in some fish species. So um, basically due to differences in habitat, you had a predominance of blue males in one area and red males in another area. And the females will start to be picky. So for example, in the um, shallow area, they'll only pick blue males to mate with. They'll only recognize blue males as males of their species. Um, and so they'll only mate with them. Same thing for the lower, uh, the lower depths, the red species, uh, the red females will only mate with the red males because they don't recognize those blue males as the same species. So that's behavioral isolation. They might technically be able to mix gametes and produce viable offspring but they're they're just not going to even be recognized by the opposite gender there are a couple of other types of isolation so habitat isolation you could have closely related species that just like to live in different places so they never encounter each other and then there's gametic isolation this is most important for organisms that reproduce in the water um, if you are near an area where fish are spawning or organisms in the aquatic organisms are reproducing, there's going to be a lot of eggs and sperm in that water because they'll just release it and let sperm find eggs. But if they're different species, um, the sperm will not um, fertilize the egg. So that's gametic isolation there. Let's look at some postzygotic isolating mechanisms. Um, and these all have to do with the fitness of hybrids. Hybrids have reduced fitness in most cases. Um, there's a multiple different possibilities. So they could have hybrid inviability, meaning two organisms from different species can reproduce, but um, they're not going to survive to, re their offspring aren't gonna survive to reproductive age. So in many frog species, you'll have, you could have some hybrids, but the tadpoles that are the offspring of those, the, the, that are the hybrid offspring won't, um, actually mature into frogs. They'll die before then. There's also hybrid infertility where you have hybrids, they'll grow up, they'll reach reproductive age, but they're sterile. They're not able to reproduce. So for example, mules have an odd number of chromosomes. They can't produce functioning gametes, so they can't reproduce. They can't reproduce with horses, donkeys, or with other mules. Um, and then there's hybrid breakdown. This happens with some aquatic organisms where you'll have the first generation might be fertile, but any further than that, um, the organisms, the hybrids or their descendants fail to survive, fail to reproduce. So all of these are barriers against the mixing of species. When you have some closely related species though, and their, their habitats overlap, um, 
and their reproductive isolation isn't quite complete yet, you can have some hybrid zones. So here are two species of frog that live in Europe. Uh, one of them lives mostly on the western parts, France, uh, Italy, looks like Greece, and then the other one lives mostly in like Eastern Europe. There is this thin zone, this orange uh, line, that actually is a hybrid zone. So since um, the populations of one frog um, can neighbor the populations of the other frog, there might be some crossbreeding happening. There may be some hybrids, but they're usually not as fit. Remember, like the hybrids between some species of frogs don't even make it to adult froghood. They just die as tadpoles. Um, so they're going to be less fit. This is um, probably not going to last too long as the reproductive isolation becomes more complete and they accumulate more genetic differences. That hybrid zone will disappear and you'll just have two species that don't interbreed. But that could take a, quite a while. Depends on their mutation rate and various things. Now we're going to look at the opposite of speciation because unfortunately species arise but species also die. Uh, that's extinction. So um, it's estimated by some people that over 99.9% .9 of all the species that have ever existed on this planet are extinct. Um, just based on looking in the fossil record, etc. So I tried to find a good phylogenetic tree of that. It was very hard to find, so I just found a phylogenetic tree that showed some extinctions. All of these species are extinct. So this is the phylogeny of penguins. So these are modern living species of penguins. They exist in the world. However, if you look at the family tree of penguins, there are many branches of the penguin family that existed but went extinct before modern times. So what causes extinction? Well, extinction happens when a species, when the organisms of a species are no longer able to survive changing conditions or against superior competition or any other environmental factors that will cause them to die before they're able to reproduce. They can, this can happen when the environment changes faster than uh, the organisms can adapt. So when there's rapid climate change or some sort of catastrophe, that can also, that can cause extinction. If you have population bottlenecks, which can then uh, decrease your genetic diversity and lead to more inbreeding, that can lead to extinction. If the geographic range where they're living becomes limited, there's um, species, for example, that have lived on islands and evolved on those islands and then sea levels changed and the islands lost land area and then those species went extinct because the land was no longer able to support them. Or if new species move in that either compete for niches or that are predators uh, that the organisms aren't adapted to. That can also lead to extinction. So extinctions have been happening all along. Um, in fact, the first extinction probably happened before there were even eukaryotic organisms. The great oxy oxygenation event where basically stuff started photosynthesizing, started building up oxygen in the atmosphere, and oxygen is poisonous to a lot of anaerobic uh, bacteria. And so those guys just died off. Unfortunately, we don't really have fossil evidence of that because bacterial fossils are, you know, not as easy to find as fossils of bones. There have been multiple mass extinctions or extinction events in, in like paleontological history. Uh, they're marked by a very sharp decline in diversity and abundance of organisms. So a lot of species go extinct within a relatively short period of time. And when I say relatively short period of time, some of these mass extinctions happened over like a couple of hundred thousand years. Uh, which may seem like, oh, that, that's a long time. Yes, but compared to the entire four and a half billion year history of the Earth, not so big a time. Um, this happens when the rate of extinction exceeds the rate of speciation. So more organisms dying off than are um, more species arising. And since in the past 500 million years, we've found evidence of about five mass extinctions. So one in the late Ordovician, which was about 440 million years ago, uh, about 85% <clears throat> of all species disappeared. They disappear in the fossil record in a very short period of time. Uh, the late Devonian, 374 million years ago, about 75% of all species disappeared. The really big one 
The largest uh, mass extinction we have evidence of is the end Permian extinction. And 95% of all species disappeared. Um, it's thought to be the closest life has come to being wiped out since it first evolved on the planet. Um, there was a Jurassic extinction, but um, the one that's most famous is the Cretaceous extinction, which it says here 145 million years ago, but that's not true. I'm thinking of the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, which it was 65 million years ago. So now I have to go back and check if this image is right. Um, that's when the non-avian dinosaurs all died off. So that's the big one we tend to think about. Um, and what causes these extinction events is usually times of uh, great ecological stress. Um, and so when there are a lot of changes in the environment, they're happening rapidly or they're very dramatic, then those can cause extinction. So things like ice ages, um, global warming events, which have happened in the past before, um, or like the end Cretaceous one, which was 65 million years ago, there's evidence that a giant asteroid hit in the Yucatan Peninsula. They found evidence of the impact crater um, and that probably triggered rapid changes in climate. There could have also been some causes. What, what I found when looking at the causes of various mass extinction events, usually it's not just one thing. It's like an asteroid hit and then some volcanoes went off and then an ice age happened and all of that was just too much for life. Um, unfortunately, we are seeing a sixth mass extinction. Uh, some people are calling it the Holocene because we're in the Holocene epoch um, or the Anthropogene extinction, which means literally caused by humans. Uh, we've changed the planet quite a bit since, um, you know, we started doing agriculture and the extinction rates of organisms have really really um reflected that so we destroy habitats um there's hunting like there's a species of pigeon that was just hunted to extinction because people like to eat it uh, we introduce invasive species that can replace uh, organisms like take over their niches and drive others extinct or that can prey on other species non-native predators as much as i love them cats are horrible for ecosystems just part of why i, I don't let mine outside um, because cats have like driven entire species of birds extinct when they've been introduced accidentally or on purpose to like islands and things like that. Pollution also causes uh, extinction of species. There are a lot of frog species that are going extinct or have become extinct. And it's thought that that's because they're very sensitive to pollution because their skin is... Um, very permeable and then climate change is going to have a pretty dramatic impact on species if nothing else think of the polar bears so just as an example this is habitat destruction in the amazon rainforest this is i think in about 2000 or 2010 so all of this green area is undisturbed rainforest and here's where people have been cutting it down um, they cut it down for logging, they cut it down for farmland, they may cut it down to build cities or buildings, but there's a lot of habitat loss there. Um, and then if you're looking at the biodiversity of an ecosystem, you can determine or you can look at the impact on biodiversity by looking at the rates of speciation and the rate of extinction. When there is more speciation than extinction, you have an increase in biodiversity. So you got a lot of different organisms in the area. When there is more extinction than there is speciation, then you're gonna have a decrease in biodiversity and you're gonna have much less diverse ecosystems. Um, extinction though, isn't always bad. I mean, it's bad for the species that go extinct, but there are benefits to the organisms that manage to survive. When organisms go extinct, their niches now become available for other organisms. Um, especially this has been very visible um, after mass extinctions. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing this axis is showing how many million years ago. So around 65 million years ago, you have the KPG or Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. And around that time, or right afterwards, you see this explosive adaptive radiation of mammals. Mammals diversify like crazy. And that's because with the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs and pterosaurs and reptiles in the sea, all of these niches start becoming available. And so organisms rapidly adapt 
um, in order to take advantage of those niches. Um, and so here we are, mammals. All right, that is the end. I forgot to change up this slide. Next up is going to be Unit 8. Be prepared for ecology, guys.